Okay, welcome everyone to this week's lecture on first language acquisition, which is a fascinating topic, but also a very complex one. So we can only touch upon a couple of things, such as why, when, how, and to what end? Why is L1 interesting? When do children learn certain linguistic elements? How do we approach child language learning? And how is that relevant to our general theorizing about what we know as people? So what is the connection to linguistic theories? So after today's lecture, you should be able to just summarize the milestones, describe some common developmental sequences, describe three major research methods that we use, including their advantages and disadvantages, and contrast two different theoretical approaches to language, especially on the question of innateness. So what are the arguments used for assuming innateness and what are the arguments used against it. Okay, with that, let's get right into it. The key question in language acquisition is obviously trying to solve the puzzle of how children learn language so perfectly within a relatively short period of time. How do they get from here to there? What stages are they going through? And what does that have to do with cognitive development more generally? So these seem to be minor questions, but there's also a lot of controversy over the answer to these questions and how much weight we assign to each of these um, aspects that are involved in it. So let's start with the uncontroversial issues. What is uncontroversial is the biological basis, right? So we as humans have the cognitive ability to learn any language that we're exposed to in our environment. The uncontroversial bit is whether we are born with knowledge that is specific to language, right? Not specific to any particular language, but to language in general. Are we born with some abstract knowledge about language? The nativists would say yes, and the emergentists would say no, we learn all that we know about language from being exposed to the language in our speech community. Now you think it's a bit absurd to assume that we have pre-born innate knowledge about language. But when you look a bit closer, it's actually rather plausible to assume that because you can hold a decent conversation with a four or five year old who can master the most complex of relative clauses, but who is unable to pour milk into a bowl of cereal without spilling any. So that has given rise to, the, to calling language acquisition a logical problem which is based on the argument of the from the poverty of the stimulus, which works like this. Children become very competent speakers rapidly and effortlessly without instruction or correction. And despite the fact that the input they receive is noisy and incomplete. So that gets us right into the question about theories of language acquisition. Now, a lot of these points you will remember from the session on Syntax 3 in week 20. So we can state here at the outset is that any theory of language in general must also account for language acquisition if it wants to be a theory about linguistic knowledge, because obviously we have to account for how we acquire that knowledge. So three theories were looking at language acquisition in particular, and I'm mentioning behaviorism at this point, even though it's a bit outdated, but it informed the two subsequent theories. Now, behaviorism famously worked on the idea of a Pavlovian conditioning. So you have a stimulus and you get a response. So their idea of language acquisition was that we learned language via imitation. So there's feedback and correction in a rewards and punishment strategy. Now, there's a empirical problem with this assumption, because there is no negative evidence and children are not corrected on their language. What does that mean? Well, that was quite nicely illustrated by um, Adele Goldberg, who says a child that says me loves you, mummy, is more likely to get a hug than being corrected on his or her grammar. On the other hand, if the child would utter I have just completed a mural on the living room wall with indelible markers, perfectly fine sentence, very complex. That child will not likely be um, positively applauded for um, this wonderful sentence. Rather, it would get 
a very negative reaction for the action it was doing. So parents and caregivers tend to respond to actions rather than linguistic utterances. So that's a question. So how does a child know that the first sentence is ungrammatical? And how does it know, well, how does he or she knows that the second one is perfectly fine if there is no feedback on these linguistic actions? So the chief architect of Universal Grammar, Noam Chomsky, said, well, no negative evidence and imperfect input. That means we need to have some innate knowledge that guides us in acquiring language. Right, so there could be a set of universal parameters that we are born with, very abstract categories and rules and um, yeah, parameters basically. And one of these parameters that we looked at in syntax three was prodrop. Right, so the assumption is that we're all born with a prodrop parameter, and you set it to on or off depending on the language that you're exposed to. Uh, so in the case of Italian, you would set it to on, meaning you can drop the pronoun, whereas in a language such as English, you cannot. So the assumption is that all languages have subjects, it's just that some languages don't express it or don't express it obligatorily. The second strategy that could be innate is the language acquisition device. Right, that's a, a process, a cognitive process that aids us specifically in the acquisition of language. By contrast, we have um, usage-based models who famously, um, or whose proponents famously assume that all structure emerges from use and through social interaction. So their view on language acquisition means that children extract patterns based on some similarities that they detect in the input, and then they generalize it to um, other contexts. So in contrast to assuming that there is a specific language acquisition device, Usage-based researchers assume that language learning is a domain general process, meaning that it's not inherently different from other cognitive processes of learning. So we don't have to assume something that guides us specifically in learning language. So the main differences are in the assumptions. What children know innately, is their abstract knowledge specific to language or not? And also in the perspective that these models uh, take on what child language actually is. Is it more adult-like? Um, that's a universal grammar's perspective, continuity assumption, meaning uh, that you can describe child language in pretty much the same way as you can describe adult language. It's just that children are not as good in their performance, but they're equally competent speakers as soon as the parameters have been set. So you could further um, classify these two approaches as adult-centered versus child-centered. Okay, so let's leave theory aside for a minute and look at some developmental stages that children go through in the course of a few years. We start with the sounds. And we can say up front that not all sounds are acquired simultaneously. So if you look at this graph that shows the sequence of phoneme acquisition, of phoneme mastery, and because the symbols are a bit difficult to see, I give them here in green as well. <coughs> now, what can we see? Well, we see that sounds that are more complex to make also tend to be those that take longer to master. So if for instance, if you look at the uh, very first group here. These are the sounds that you generally produce with your lips or that are produced uh, deep down in your throat, requiring either relatively little modulation of the airstream or which are produced with something that is clearly visible to the child. So here imitation may actually guide a child um, and help a child acquiring these sounds. The second group, by contrast, are those sounds that are produced further back in the mouth and require more elaborate modulation with the tongue. So that would explain why they are in, on average, acquired later than um, the first group. The yeah, obvious contenders of complex sounds would include the affricates here and here, as well as the interdental fricatives. They're also quite complex to make and they take uh, relatively long. And these are also the ones that are cross-linguistically very rare. <coughs> 
And there's a second pattern that we can see is that if you have a contrastive pair, if they're not mastered simultaneously, such as per and per, you see that the voiceless version is always acquired first. So voicing is also, a, uh, from this graph, um, a rather difficult thing to do over the voiceless uh, sounds. So moving on to the first words, that's generally what lay people assume the super milestone in language acquisition. And that route varies by children, uh, but the order will be roughly um, similar. So around right about their first birthdays, children produce their first words, which are sometimes called proto-words. And the obvious problem here is whether it is a word or an utterance. So a child at a breakfast table that says milk, is that just a word or is it a, m a, a larger, a richer communi uh, communicative um, action? In which case we would talk about um, hollow phrases. Um, what is clear and surprisingly is that the first words that a child can muster are general basic level words in the here and now of the child and complex more abstract words would be uh, acquired later. We measure the growing, the, the growth of vocabulary and the growth of complexity in the mean length of the utterance, right, from a one word stage to a two word stage, um, which also means that um, we have to make a decision on what uh, what's a word or what not. So a lot of research these days would work on the mean length of utterance in morphemes rather than words, but they're um, unsurprisingly very closely correlated. Okay, so if we move on to morphosyntax, we can look at this table. So what this table shows is how children acquire different morphemes between the ages of um, two to four, roughly. They begin with a two-word phrase, to which we'll turn in a minute. And as children get older, so does their morphosyntactic complexity. Right? So you see the age um, listed here, and you see the mean length of utterance in uh, this, the third column. And you also see that there is quite a range of um, mean length of utterance, which refers a bit also to individual differences between children. Now what we can see um, in terms of patterns is that simpler or more salient morphemes are acquired earlier than more complex and opaque morphemes. What do we mean by that? Well, if you look at the uh, progressive ing, that's a relatively simple or salient morpheme because it's phonologically very rich, so you can make it out very quickly. Now compare that to the possessive s. Um, as a voiceless fricative, it's Phon phonetically not as rich, and it's wedged within a clause or phrase, which makes it a bit more difficult for children to work out what the meaning is and to segment it into being a specific morpheme. Another example is the, um, the S, the plural S, versus the third person singular S. A plural is relatively straightforward and very accessible, right? If a child sees more than one of uh, an object, it has to add an S. It's very regular, bearing some um, irregular plurals, of course. But compare that to the third person singular S. That cannot be straightforwardly linked to anything in the outside world, so it's not as accessible to the child. The third person singular S is a historical leftover, more or less, uh, so there's no motivation in using that inflection. And it also encodes uh, three very abstract categories, person, number, and tense at the same time. So that's a lot for a child to work out. Finally, we have relational items, uh, the prepositions in, on, which are, again, relatively accessible, in the box, on the shelf, as opposed to definiteness and indefiniteness. That's something rather abstract that the child takes longer to master uh, fully. So we can say that although different studies come to different rankings, perhaps, in general, all these studies agree on that you have a, a pathway from something more simple to something more complex. A second example of morphosyntactic milestone is the phenomenon of over-regularization. It's also called U-shaped learning or starting to talk worse. So we take, for example, irregular verbs, um, and by about this, uh, the age two and a half, children 
use go and went right and it's where parents get really really proud saying like oh my child can correctly conjugate the verbs and what then happens r just before their third birthdays is that they start to regularize the verbs, right? They would say go and goed and make and maked. And you can see that in these two graphs um, where the error rate in irregular verbs increases around about um, just before their third birthdays. Now, what happens? Well, it's sort of th that stage where children mature morpholinguistically and they have acquired a pattern. They have worked out that whenever you talk about something in the past, you just add ed. Therefore, they apply it to all verbs that they um, use it. It's called overgeneralization. Now, we have to qualify here a bit. The effect is, n effect is not as dramatic and it's more dramatic on uh, sorry, on uh, low frequency verbs, right? So low frequency verbs are more likely to be regularized by children, uh, presumably because they don't hear uh, the irregular form as often as they would with go and uh, make. Now they now have to unlearn this overgeneralization again, uh, which takes quite a few years actually uh, to master that completely. Um, and they presumably presumably do that because they continue to hear went instead of goad. They work out, okay, so no one says it. So that gives them some kind of indirect evidence of that goad may be wrong. And then they say, right, okay, so I have to adjust my lexical entry of um, went and I have to store went alongside uh, a more regular pattern as you would with all the other irregular verbs, of course. Okay, so that's it for more for syntax. Let's move on to the final aspect here, constructions and simple sentences. And that is the most complex uh, aspect of all. And it's also where the two contrasting theories um, meet with greatest force because they make very, very different uh, predictions and very different assumptions. And they explain the phenomenon very differently. Okay, so after the one word stage uh, or the holophrase stage, um, children now move on to uh, two word stage. It's also called the pivot schema stage where you have a fixed and an open slot, such as more x, where is x, let's x. So where is and let's, although they're for us two different items or two separate morphemes, uh, for children, they probably assume that it's just one thing um, fused together. So it takes them a while to work out that this is actually two separate um, issues. Right, so you can see that they also generalize or apply that um, pattern to all sorts of things that you can fit into that slot that was based on similarities. That gives the impression that children have some creativity, although they are actually relatively repetitive in um, early stages. Over time, they slowly generalize that also to new context, um, com uh, contexts and they add more complexity to it, uh, such as they move from where is daddy uh, to where is the tiger uh, to where was the brown tiger, right? So they continuously uh, move away from the pivot stage or the two word stage into more complex um, things. Now, how do you account for that? So the Usage-based approach is by and large uh, an item-based approach, meaning that they form this knowledge, this more abstract knowledge about these patterns by abstracting or generalizing overheard instances. That's a bit of a mouthful, but how does that work? So that, that's a, just a general example. They would hear the cat and again, and then when they hear it again, they realize, ah, we have two tokens here. We also have a type, sort of an abstract unit. They would hear the same thing with the dog, aha, uh -huh, type. And then they realize the type for the dog and the cat, they share some similarities. So there might be like some more abstract pattern, the N. Add indefinite um, articles to it. You would have like a, uh, n, or n, noun. Again, we have some similarities that would allow the generalization to say, ah, there must be something like determiner noun. So from working in a bottom-up um, fashion, you have worked out the structure of an English noun phrase. Now contrast that to the universal grammar perspective, which works on uh, rules and parameters. So the rule for the English noun phrase uh, would be set to NP determiner, optional adjective, uh, and a noun, which 
once this has been set for English, would allow you to produce and understand in a top-down fashion the phrase the dog. Right, so usage-based models work in a bottom-up fashion, whereas um, universal grammar assumes that you have a top-down uh, process. Okay, so that um, leads us to uh, an overview of developmental milestones. I have to stress it's just a rough guide and children vary a lot, but we can detect some overall um, patterns. So in um, their first years of age, pretty much we have lots to do with sounds. And we come to the rhythmic patterns that have an influence on um, the child pre-birth as well. So we can uh, say that language development happens in overlapping stages and it happens from simple units to complex units, from concrete to abstract and so on and so forth. And we should also not forget pragmatics. To be a competent speaker of a language and a competent um, member of a speech community would also require you to be uh, to have some pragmatic competence. So very young children are usually very bad in um, detecting irony, sarcasm, and even conversational implicages take them quite a while to master. At the same time, we also have sociocognitive developments, um, mutual gaze, right? You sort of follow the gaze of other people, joint attention, right? Are we doing the similar things, uh, communicative gestures. So here you have elements that are relevant to be a, a competent member in a speech situation. And we see that the core of these abilities uh, mature and show their greatest impact between the ages just before their first birthdays and maybe um, two, two and a half, three. So they coincide with the spurt in linguistic complexity that children uh, acquire. I have uh, mentioned pattern finding a couple of times and uh, pattern finding is uh, a domain general process, right? We're very good at hu as humans to detect patterns in anything that we see and then we assign meaning to it. And that's an evolutionary advantage, right? If you walk through the forest and you have two round things looking at you, if you do not assign any meaning to that pattern that you see, you're more likely to remove yourself from the gene pool. So this cognitive ability is assumed, at least in uh, usage-based approaches, to be a significant or um, a major um, strategy that children em employ to acquire language. A final thing that we should mention at this point is that uh, children understand more than they produce, right? So um, comprehension is always uh, superior to production in that uh, development. That said, that makes it a bit difficult for us approaching child language data and finding out what children actually know. So let's turn to some uh, methods. We can generally classify the methods into observational or experimental. Uh, they differ in the way that they are sampled. How do you get your groups, right? The longitudinal would be um, looking at a child um, through the course of time or several children through the course of time. Cross-sectional would compare different age groups, uh, for instance. These terms roughly uh, correspond to the real time and apparent time a distinction that we made in sociolinguistics. And then methods also differ with whether they look at pre-verbal children, right, in uh, infancy or even before birth, or whether you look at verbal uh, children that already know um, and can produce uh, some linguistic items. Different methods have different audiences, right, and they also have different aims, of course. And many methods may actually use a, m a mix of, um, uh, of these typological um, landmarks. So let's start with the oldest one, and it's also the simplest. Uh, that's parent diaries, where parents keep records of especially the lexical development in lists of words. It's an inexpensive method, and it doesn't require a substantial training. However, it can be relatively subjective and unreliable because you subconsciously miss some items, or you may pay more attention subconsciously to um, other aspects. So yeah, you can only use that for early lexical acquisition, uh, which is less complex. Um, so if you looked at syntactic uh, development, uh, lay people would be a lot um, more unreliable in this respect. 
The method is not without its merits. It's hundreds of years old, and a lot that we know about early word acquisition dates from uh, more than 100 years, um, and it hasn't changed, obviously, because that is assumed to be a general um, process. Okay, so now let's move on to some experimental methods and start with the uh, youngest children. Now, obviously, because we can't ask little children anything or press any buttons, uh, we have to be a little more creative in how we um, investigate uh, language. And one of them is the high amplitude sucking technique, which can be used in um, infants up to three months, roughly. And it's used to study the perceptual ability. The idea behind it is that infants suck on a pacifier that is connected to a computer, so it can record the sucking frequency or intensity which is measured in response to a particular stimulus that is played to the um, child via headphones. An example of that technique would be uh, Moon and colleagues who um, looked at newborns from Sweden and the US right after birth. And they exposed these children to uh, vowel sounds of Swedish U and English E. They're relatively similar, they differ in roundedness. And they measured how children were sucking on the pacifier in response to these stimuli. And you can actually detect that they were able to discriminate uh, between the two sounds, um, meaning that you have higher sucking rates for um, non-native sounds as opposed to native sounds. Now, the assumption behind that is that when the child hears something that they are used to, they would get bored and suck less. If they get excited because they hear something new, they would suck harder and more intensely. So this is an, a piece of evidence uh, for pre-linguistic uh, or pre-birth influence because the study didn't detect any effect since time of birth. So whether they were seven hours old or 77 hours or a few days, it didn't make any difference. So that pattern is very difficult to explain unless you assumed some form of um, an influence of the rhythmic patterns that children are exposed to in the, in the womb. Um, so this is actually a quite a neat um, approach. Okay, with older children, toddlers, um, and beyond their sucking um, age, uh, perhaps, we have two paradigms that are quite similar. They test different things, but uh, we can discuss them together. It's a head turning or preferential looking paradigms, and they test comprehension of sounds, words, uh, and even constructions. And the basic idea is that the babies or toddlers are sat in front of uh, either two screens or two speakers. And what is measured is where do they turn to in response to a stimulus. So in the head turning paradigm, an example uh, would be Cool et al, which um, looked at American and Japanese infants and they exposed them to stimuli of ra and la. Now, l and er are phonemic in English, meaning they're different sounds, they can distinguish meaning. So um, English people recognize them as two different sound sounds, whereas in Japanese, these two sounds are allophonic, they're just variants of the same sound. So what the head turning paradigm measures is that children are trained to turn their heads if they hear a new sound. So what they found is that at around um, six months of age, children, whether they're Japanese or English uh, um, speaking children or children from English or Japanese speaking areas, they don't differ at this uh, task, uh, which suggests that at that stage, both l and er are new sounds for both um, groups of children. But four to six months later, that actually changes. American children get better and the Japanese children get worse, which suggests that, that by that age, um, l and er are different sounds for the American children, but still the same thing for Japanese children. So here we have an indicator uh, that our ability to distinguish sounds already disappears or starts disappearing in uh, our first year of life. The preferential looking paradigm is similar in the sense that you look at what, how does the child, uh, how does the child uh, react? What does it look at? <coughs> and basically you give a child two different scenes and 
the child also hears a sentence um, in bef before they uh, have the scenes. And the idea is that the child will preferably look at the scene that matches the sentence um, they're hearing. So this has been used, for instance, in who did what to whom uh, situations, um, so to test whether children, when children have an understanding of uh, passive constructions, for instance. A final experimental method is elicitation, uh, which is used to study production. Um, how do children, or do children already have knowledge of a particular pattern? And the most famous one of that is the so-called rock test, and quite iconic in linguistics, which tested preschoolers, first graders, and adults on their correct responses or correct plural allomorphs of z, z and is on nonce words, right? So famously in English, um, we have different allomorphs depending on uh, whether you have a voiced or a voiceless um, final sound. So the nonce word was a wog, right? This is a wog. Now there, there's another one. There's two of them. Now there are two wogs. And they looked at whether children would say wogs or wogs. And it turns out that preschoolers are pretty good at applying that rule, um, but that increases with school age. So first graders performed even better and adults were almost um, at ceiling, performing near perfectly. So at this stage, we can summarize some of the um, advantages and disadvantages of experimental methods is that a definite plus is that you can test very specific hypotheses that you couldn't test with just looking at a child. On the negative side, they're not, it's not a naturalistic situation. They're quite artificial lab situations. And so there may be effects of the task. Um, and it may actually um, fail to do. So in the study with the Japanese and American children, I think in the end, the data set contained about 30 uh, odd participants, but they had to exclude 144 children because they were either crying or <coughs> the equipment was failing um, or they didn't get quite get what the task was. So uh, yeah, I mean, that these are all aspects that you have to deal with. So that leads us to corpora. And you're all familiar with uh, corpus linguistic methods, so that won't come as a total surprise to you. The absolute game changer, perhaps, in um, child language acquisition research is the uh, collection now known as CHILDIS, the Child Language Data Exchange System, which is not a corpus in itself, but it's a collection of corpora for different um, languages that result from quite different um, individual projects. So any research project that would compile a corpus for a specific purpose that they wanted to investigate, they would then make that available to uh, researchers. Many of these corpora come with part of speech tagging, um, also grammatical tagging or parsing, and some of them also contain very detailed information on the extra linguistic context. So what was happening as the child um, was being recorded. Many come with audio and video files, and we're going to look at an example in a second. I just want to point out at this point one new paradigm that's not part of the child's corpus, but which sort of falls into that category as well, where research researchers looked um, at children from the perspective of the toddler by fitting cameras on their heads. And they found relatively interesting things such as that a spurt in word learning occurs when children are able to hold their heads still, hold the objects and turn the objects as well. So there's some general categorization um, shape uh, would make a difference as well, right? So uh, that just as a, a little excursion. So the one example we're going to look at is from a lab setting where the mother and the child were coming into the lab and they were sat on a little carpet and have a bit of playtime and they were being recorded while doing that. Great, I'm going to make sure the camera's ready. I'm going to come in and clap my hands because that way they can link the video and the sound yes. when they bring us okay. the DVD. All right, mm -hmm. let me just check. Are we ready for a clap? Doing the check. Doing the check, yeah. Can I use the wine? What's the wine? You're doing I'm the wine. I'm just going to clap my hands. 
I'd like some wine too. <laughs> Have fun. Thank you. Say bye, see you later. Bye bye. bye. See you in a little while. Enjoy bye. the toys. <laughs> you could give that to mummy. Thank you. Oh, we dropped it. Yeah, it's dropped it. then. Mummy. So, did you see Maddie this morning? Yes. Yeah. What did you do with Maddie this morning? Um, and some biscuit and drink. Oh, you had a biscuit and some drink. And yeah. did you play with the dollies with Maddie? Yeah. Is she your friend? And I did some shopping. You did some shopping? Yeah. With Maddie? Yeah, Maddie. And, and I saw you with your big basket of food. Did you go to the supermarket? And bread. It's a, it's a big hard. <gasps> a big hard bread? Yeah, a big hard bread. Oh, wow. And, and a, um, um, making shopping. Oh, oh you got lots of shopping in here. Should we get the shopping out? Yeah. Should we get the shopping out? Shall we, watch it? Should we see what's in this box? Who's that there? Woof, woof. He's a woof, woof. Okay, I mean, I think that's cute enough to warrant a couple of minutes overtime in this lecture. So what you can see, obviously, is that we have a relatively naturalistic um, situation um, and we have a lot of context information as well if it's transcribed properly. Um, that is what I meant before by game changer because a lot of things that we um, assumed about the input that children receive was uh, strongly revised after um, a lot of these studies where we looked at how are children spoken to. On the downside, of course, we have incomplete samples. We can't record everything that the child says or hears. So we have, and we also have limited periods that children are um, monitored and uh, recorded. And there's also the problem of um, being recorded, not so much perhaps for the child, but uh, certainly for the parents. If the parents know they're being recorded, are they going to adjust the way they speak to their children? There are some corpora that contain uh, recordings from inside people's homes. Um, so even being more naturalistic than in, in this um, setup lab um, situation. The problem of incomplete samples um, is sometimes approached in dense monitoring. That's when very few children are recorded multiple times per week for several hours over an extended period of time, uh, which is a very time consuming procedure. And it's also limited in how much you can say then about other children because you have a relatively small uh, sample size. One example I would like to mention at this point, which is an example of an extremely um, dense uh, sampling uh, paradigm, is um, Deb Roy wired his entire house with cameras and microphones, collecting over 90,000 hours of video and 140,000 hours of audio over the course of three years, which amounts to about 7 million words of text, which is by any standard, even for adult language corpora, a decent sized corpus. Obviously, you'd have some limits to generalizability because it's more or less just this one child. So you can uh, watch the TED talk, and that's why it made um, international news, more or less. Um, and the reason I'm showing it, so be a bit cautious about um, the claims he makes in that video, uh, is exaggerating a little at some points. But the reason I'm showing this, because he has this time lapse of a single word over the course of um, six months of how his son acquired um, the word water. Well, not acquired, a child actually knew what the word was, but it took quite some effort to get it right. Okay, so what this shows obviously that a child has to go through lots of trial and error. It is a laborious process, it's also a very long process, and so they get it right and wrong a lot of the times. 
and it requires a lot of practice and you could almost hear sometimes the child's effort and frustration even over not getting it right. Okay, so what um, does that tell us? I give you a quick overview here of different methods with some additional information. I do want to point out these two short videos um, that you can watch on YouTube that introduce you to the experimental paradigms as well as um, the childless database in slightly more detail. Okay, now that gets us back to uh, theory. So for the final uh, section here, we kind of bring things back together. And I want to revisit the argument from the poverty of the stimulus and all these sub-arguments that are um, presented in, in this context that would motivate assuming some innate knowledge. The first and um, most important one perhaps is that the assumption was for a long time is that the input is incomplete and a lot of people still have that assumption because some constructions never occur in the input. Now that ultimately depends on the size of your corpus or what the model constructions are from which children can extract uh, patterns and then extend it to other contexts, uttering sentences that they haven't heard before. The second one is um, related to that is that the input is noisy. As children hear ungrammatical and incomplete utterances, false starts, fragments, stuff like that. And while that is true, that children do hear a lot of fragments, child-directed speech is also very simple and highly repetitive and therefore actually quite regular. So they hear lots of the same thing over and over again. Now that wasn't possible to to detect without the use of corpora, um, obviously. The argument um, of no negative evidence that we looked at in the beginning, where that says that children are not corrected on the ungrammatical sentences that they hear, uh, that they utter, is um, you can look at it from a different perspective, is that there is indirect evidence, right? So you saw in this one video clip is where the parent repeated a lot of the things that the child said. So children's utterances are often repeated and they're more likely repeated in the correct form if the child made um, an error. So this is some sense of statistical feedback. If you, if you, you aren't being corrected or explicitly corrected, but you're implicitly uh, corrected. A major cornerstone of the um, poverty of the stimulus argument is that adults converge on the same grammar, despite being exposed to different inputs. Now that is a question of how categorical you assume this to be, right? So um, universal grammar approaches tend to say that this is categorical. All grammars, will, uh, all adults will arrive at the same grammar. Whereas usage-based um, approaches would argue that there are huge individual differences, so adults do not have the same mental representation of different grammatical constructions. So these individual differences in development and their linguistic abilities depends more or less or quite strongly on uh, the input quantity and quality, uh, right? So um, there are numerous studies that show that middle-class children receive more input, they're more often spoken to than um, lower class or welfare class um, children. So that correlates, so the linguistic development correlates with a socioeconomic background and general cognitive ability. Now, if you receive more input, that input is also more likely more variable and a greater variability in the types of verbs that occur in a construction, for instance, will facilitate your pattern extraction possibilities or abilities. So finally, um, the argument is that language acquisition is quick and effortless. That's a matter of perspective, probably. Uh, you could also see that, well, okay, okay, children mostly acquire language between the ages one and four or five, but that's a very laborious process and it's it, complex construction can take years into adolescence, even into adulthood, uh, to master. And they depend on how much education you receive. So many of the very complex sentences that we talk about um, would be mastered more easily by educated people um, with higher education abilities. So here, usage-based models look at this issue in, again, in terms of continua rather than as a categorical perspective. So what we do assume is that the rate of growth 
slows down, right? As young children, you are you have it easier to learn uh, language or any foreign language. And as we all know, once we're adults, we try to learn a foreign language uh, that will become increasingly uh, difficult. Many of that would also have to do with how a little input we receive in the target language. So we could sum up here is that the arguments that are presented um, in the context of poverty of the stimulus that then give rise to innateness, um, they actually lack empirical evidence. Once you start looking closer um, at what child language is and what the input is that children receive. With what we know from large uh, observational studies is that all these arguments that are listed here have alternative ex um, explanations um, which substantially reduce uh, or weaken the plausibility or even the necessity of having to assume innateness in order to account for language acquisition. So here we are, have some uh, concluding remarks um, is that, yep, children go through different incremental overlapping st uh, phases in their language development, moving from concrete to abstract, simple to complex, while showing great individual differences, they will show very similar patterns with, re with respect to uh, complexity. We have me various methods to approach these purposes. We're not one method is better than another because they serve different purposes. Then we have different theories that account for these observations. Um, depending on their assumptions or axioms uh, regarding innateness, uh, separate learning device, or being an adult-focused um, or child-focused um, approach. So here we have the puzzle of first language acquisition that is very, very um, interesting, but at the same time also very contentious. So there's a lot of exciting um, research going on. With that, I'll leave you with an outlook for next week for second language acquisition, where this aspect will be picked up again, um, again in usage-based models. So we would assume that second language acquisition is not inherently different to first language acquisition. So we would speak rather of a sensitive period versus a critical period that um, the universal grammar people would assume. Right. So we have here some uh, study questions for your revisions, some references. And with that, I'm looking forward to seeing you in the forum and in the seminar. Bye.